A couple weeks ago, I talked about a lot of what's wrong with the Democrat Party right now. It's only fair, in the interest of the ancient principle of equal time, that I talk about the GOP this week and what's wrong with them. Please understand that these criticisms are meant to help both parties draw back towards the center of the political spectrum and start working together for the benefit of the United States. I believe that by doing this, we can have a much more functional government at all levels. I am convinced that this will benefit all Americans, which is why it's time again for some roasted opinions on the subject. The current status of the Republican Party is this. The leader of the party is Ronna McDaniel, the niece of the former governor and presidential candidate Mitt Romney. She is a staunch supporter of Donald Trump, the president of the United States. Now, Trump is definitely a wild card in the mix, but we will get to that. First, we need to talk about the factions in the GOP as I see them. The bulk of the Republican Party is firmly pragmatic. They may not like Donald Trump or his methods of leadership, but they recognize that his policies are largely in keeping with the party platform. They also recognize that Trump brings a voting block to the party, which they always felt was just out of reach, blue-collar workers. Therefore, they are supporting his policies as much as they feel that they are able, given some of the controversies involved. Their goal is to remain in power, much like the goal of the old guard Democrats. There is a smaller group of Republicans which believe that Donald Trump is a second cousin of the Antichrist. They are the Never Trump movement. Springing up during the 2016 election cycle, these conservatives maintain that Trump is destroying the party and the country. To them, he has no business being president or in politics. Finally, there is the alt-right, like the blue-collar Trump supporters that back Trump. They agree with the Never Trump movement that the president will lead America into a new era of reactionary fascistic government. But unlike the Never Trump movement, they're actually happy about this. These three factions are largely at odds with one another. The pragmatists want the Never Trumpers to get on board before the Democrats regain control of Congress and the White House. The Never Trumpers want Trump out, via impeachment if necessary, and they want the alt-right thrown out along with him. They view the pragmatists as traitors to the party's ideals. The alt-right views the never-Trumpers as traitors too and consider the pragmatists as Republicans in name only or rhinos. Then there's President Donald J. Trump. He is, for lack of a better description, the ultimate Washington outsider. An interesting mix, if you will, of Jeff Smith from Mr. Smith Goes to Washington and Jules Winfield from Pulp Fiction. Trump doesn't give a fig for the way things used to work. He cares only about the way things ought to be and getting those things done. Unlike every president before him in the history of the country, Trump has absolutely no public service in his life before he was elected president. No government offices, no military service, nothing at all in the public sector. Instead, his history is that of a venture capitalist, a real estate developer, and an international businessman. He's not above finding another way around a problem, and he doesn't take no lightly. And that's the rub about Trump, isn't it? The legacy media, which prides itself in shaping the news to the message which they intend to give, used to take briefings from the White House press secretary and then go write their stories about what the president is doing, according to them. By the time the news filtered down to the rest of America, it was spinning like a gyroscope. But Donald Trump doesn't like that everyone else is filtering and repackaging what he says to change the meaning or tone. He is a blunt man often insulting and not at all willing to have his words twisted. Thus, we have the Donald Trump Twitter account, where he makes statements directly to the American public, no White House communications polishing, and no filtering by the White House press corps, just the unvarnished thoughts of the president in 288 characters or less. Naturally, the press corps cannot stand this. How dare he bypass them? Doesn't he understand that they have an important job in American politics as the representatives of the people? Except that they don't, and they aren't, at least not anymore. I have read the Constitution carefully, and I find no mention of the White House press corps in it at all. Do I agree with everything that Donald Trump has to say? Um, no. Just no. I don't like what he says sometimes, and I don't like how he says it, either. The man is crass and derogatory. 
But do I think that he should lose his access to Twitter and be forced to run things through the communications office and the press corps? No. Do I think that his tweets should be labeled as a violation of Twitter's policies and still published? Again, no. The president is communicating directly with the American people at an unprecedented level. Whether we like or don't like what he has to say, at least we don't have to wonder who told him to say it or who repackaged it for him. Now that we are going into the presidential election cycle, Donald Trump is out and about campaigning directly with the American people again. And like the Democrat Party, the GOP is campaigning about Trump. Either they are for his policies and drumming up support for Trump voters, or they are against him and are appealing to the Never Trump faction to help them rein him in and get him out of office. Excuse me? Yes, I mean that the GOP cannot make up its mind whether to stand by Donald Trump's policies or to stand against Trump, the Republican President of the United States, and the person who appointed the National Committee Chairperson, Ronna McDaniel. Miss McDaniel, meanwhile, is fully behind Trump and his policy. Come to think of it, a lot of rank-and-file registered Republicans back Donald Trump's policy, as well as a lot of blue-collar workers who voted for him during 2016 because he promised to bring back jobs. Strangely enough, jobs are back, so those blue-collar workers are in play again. There has been a lot of mud slung at Trump. This makes sense to me because he simultaneously pissed off the Democrats by defeating Hillary Clinton and by insulting reporters to their faces. You are fake news, remember? Since the legacy press and much of the new online press specialize in pushing agendas and bridging the gap between the Democrat Party and far-left activism, they've been out after Trump. Trump is polarizing the country between those who cannot understand why everyone won't listen to them and those who refuse to be told what to do by someone who knows nothing about their life. And the interesting thing is that this is happening between intellectuals and working-class stiffs on both sides of the aisle. Conservative snobbery is being rejected by marginalized groups, and ivory tower liberalism is being rejected by blue-collar workers and the shrinking middle class. I've personally heard people claim that they are afraid of Trump and his policy, even when his policies bear no resemblance to what those people claim they are. I've personally heard people claim that Trump is going to restore America, including promulgating those policies which others fear so much, and I have yet to hear Trump actually state any of the policy which people fear. I've never seen the whole of the Western world so focused on the actions of one man in my lifetime, and I can't find anything like it in modern history since World War II. The closest parallel to the Trump presidency which I can find in U.S. history is actually the Lincoln presidency when the United States tore itself in half. Abraham Lincoln wasn't revered until after his death. Somehow, I don't believe that President Trump will be revered as much as reviled. But in all honesty, not even Lincoln enjoyed universal acclaim, and yet Lincoln consistently ranks with George Washington as one of the greatest presidents. Now, the biggest problem is that, like the Democrats, the GOP has made this election entirely about Trump. No one is paying sufficient attention to the more than 450 other federal offices up for election. So many voices cry out that Trump is a dictator, and yet hang on his every word and every rumor about him, as if there were no other elected officials that were helping to run the country. If only there was a co-equal branch of government responsible for legislation. Oh, right, there is. The GOP needs to look at what's happening to the Democrat Party and see the parallels within their own ranks. They need to remember that a small drift away from the center creates a huge gulf between the parties on policy and they don't need to drift any further away from the middle right now. That's the problem in both parties, to different extents, and strangely, they are ignoring all of those people in the middle, the people who are worried about the rising student debt crisis, and also decent trade deals and decent jobs, the people who were forgotten or ignored for years, ever since the early 90s when everyone assumed that the Democrats had a lock on their votes. Whichever party stops ignoring them and starts listening to them, will be elected. That's a fundamental principle to which both parties should pay closer attention.